Hey, man, how are you? I'm doing good. Just, um, you know, just waiting for life to return to uh, what, what we do and uh, looking forward to getting back on the road again. Yeah. Where are you now exactly other than in your house? I live in Pasadena. I'm right oh, by okay. the Rose Bowl out here oh, in Pasadena. Okay. okay. How about uh, you? Well, I'm in my apartment in New York still, you know. Uh, I usually try to get out this time of day. New York is like 11.56, 11.46. Yeah. Uh, but I had some emails to do this morning, and that kind of delayed me getting out. And the sun is really shining, so I, I'll mm. assure you that before the day is gone, I'll get out there and get some some legitimate vitamin D. You know? Yeah, I'm I'm anxious to get back there. I just want to get some pizza. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a good place for you to go. When you come back, I'll take you to my favorite pizza joint. Okay, which one is that? I'm not going to tell you, man. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we used to go to a, there was a place called Charlie's Corner on 58th and Lexington. Mm -hmm. And uh, man, Wadi Wachtel turned me on to it, you know, back around 1971. And that was our go-to place. But apparently at one point, the uh, landlords decided to really stiff the people and oh, raise man. their rent so much that they, uh, I think they're out in Long Island. Uh, they, yeah, they moved back seems, home. But, that uh, seems to be the management's a posture these days gods yeah. while you can you know yeah, exactly I, yeah it's heartbreaking you know these yeah, people I'm looking at, I'm looking at all these their stores. lives yeah i'm looking at all these stores that i used to to patronize and and they're all gone i'm wondering where did these people go and how they're how are they getting through these difficult times and made more complicated by a greedy landlord you know yeah the same thing out here in la so many places over this past year and a half have have gone under and never to return. Mm, mm, yeah, mm, it's mm, uh, mm, it's it. This has been a, such a tough time for uh, yeah. for humanity. Yeah, and yeah. ongoing. Well, it's good to see that you're doing up that you're up and well. And, and uh, one of the reasons I want to talk with you, we never really had a conversation other than passing, you know. And I like to yeah, sit on the, talk. the, the <laughs> webinars and stuff. Yeah, yeah, since we're sitting down, it's nice to talk with you. Sitting down, <laughs> sitting down conversation. <laughs> uh, and and knowing your work and knowing your your record of work, I have a couple of questions. Actually, four questions Absolutely. to ask you. Uh, that I'm interested to have you take on these kind of questions. Sure, I'm happy to do it. Uh, this is not on my question. This is not on my list. But the separate thing occurred to me yet last night uh, when I've seen your performances on YouTube and wherever they're allowed to film. Uh, none of you guys are reading music other than the keyboard player. You know. Uh, depends, depends, on, uh, depends on the gig, but generally not. Usually I have to commit everything to memory. I, I'm never, I, I've never not been a fan of that, but I found that just a little distracting to try to remember all this stuff as the stuff is going on around me live, you know. And uh, one of the things that, that was good about the, the Miles Davis band that there weren't a lot of different tunes to learn by reading because you only saw the music when you got to the gig. We had no yeah. rehearsal times, and there were no conversations about how the student is supposed to work once we recorded. We were kind of on our own, using our own devices, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. You know, and, and I watch you guys play, and, and uh, you know, the only person literally has, is, a, is a piano player, by and large, a keyboard player. You know? um, yeah. My question to you is, how comfortable are you to have music in front of you as opposed to not having it? Um. It's a it's a difficult situation. I've always kind of felt that if I have like like when I work with Lyle Lovett, um, Lyle will call me like to do a corporate, and he'll have thirty songs that he wants to do, but he wants you to know them uh, for memory. Oh, wow. So there's a lo a lot of work goes into doing a one off gig that you're not paid for. Yeah. Um, for that time, but I've always felt that especially. Uh, when you're really highly visible on stage within a band, if you're the guy that's up there with a the music stand, you look like hired help mm -hmm. um, as compared to a member of the band. Mm -hmm. So I actually, over the years, like with when I went out with Toto, I had five days to learn their show. And it was a really complicated show. So I immersed myself for five days in it and learned it. Um, but there are times I'm going out on a tour um, in the middle of July with Peter Asher and Kate Taylor, James Taylor's sister and Albert Lee. And, uh, and I've got charts. So I'm going to be able to read charts for that. So it depends, it depends on the gig. 
Um, but um, I, when I've learned the songs, I'm, I'm much more comfortable performing. I'm not glued to a piece of paper. I've, yeah. Once I've really learned them, then I can, then I can go with them and, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, and reinterpret every night a little bit and things like okay. that. Okay. Uh, a funny story was Don, with James Taylor many years ago. Don Grolink was I know, playing I know Don. Music. Yes, my, yeah. like my good Great. friend. But he played his oh, ass yeah. off too, man. I love Don so much. Um, but he would drag out his charts every night, and we'd been on the road forever. <laughs> and he finally came to one gig, and we were all backstage behind a shed. And there was a big garbage can there with a fire in it. And he goes, oh, what's that? And I looked at him. I said, it's your charts, dude. <laughs> and he burned all his music and said, play the show. <laughs> and he, I mean, he played it beautifully. But it, for him, it looked so ridiculous. He had music all over the top of the piano and yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. during the show. So <laughs> it's like. You know, speaking of Kate Taylor, her name came across my desk about three months ago. My friend is doing a project that involves my recording career as we mm -hmm. talk about careers. And uh, he mentioned uh, James Taylor, you know, and I said, I, I know everybody knows James Taylor. Steve Gadd sounded great with him, you know. Uh, he, Steve had a great drum sound. He had a great snare drum sound. And it was oh, just yes. perfect for the bass player at that time to find spaces to play because Steve's sound allowed that kind of activity. Yeah. But I had made a record with him, a date with her, Kate, and, and uh, the song was called uh, Harriet Tubman. Wow. I haven't even so heard of that. A moment, if you go to her site and, and take a look at that record, that track of her record that I'm on, uh, it won't make your job any easier, but you know that I went there at one time trying to find out how that stuff's supposed to work too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. I'll check great it out for sure. Oh. Yeah, the bass sounded really good that day, and I appreciated the bass and giving me a chance to make this work. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good band. Richard Teves on the on the track. Uh, Steve Farone's playing oh. drums. You know, and, and the track is called Harriet Tubman. Oh, I'd love to check it out and see what and see what kind of a lyrical yeah. thing she put together for Harriet. And I haven't seen her since then. I've called. I, I, I kind of lost track of those people after all this time. You know, I'm glad she's still available, still singing. And please give her my regards. She's doing, yeah, she's doing great. It's funny. We did her first album, Sister Kate, back in 1971. And then we just did a new album with her. We, 50 years later, we had almost <laughs> the same band back together with really? Russ Kunkel and myself and, and Cooch and, and uh, Waddy Wachtel and Albert Lee and Peter Asher producing. Yeah, the yeah. only difference was uh, Russ's son, Nathaniel, is engineering it. And when we did the first album, he was a newborn. <laughs> so <laughs> Time keeps moving on despite us. Wow, it's amazing. Yeah. Okay, now we get down to the serious business of these four questions. Okie doke. Uh, you, you've been off for a while, like we all have for the past 15 or 16 months. You know, we've had a lot of chance to do other things. And uh, we've, had, we've been forced to do, not do the things that we are really comfortable to do, and that's playing gigs and making music with other people. Mm -hmm. uh, but with that backdrop, when you get your first really gig, I don't mean the streaming thing, I mean, you're really on the bandstand. Wherever you do, everything you do counts. And yeah. there are people around you, the audience, the band who are seeing this event take place live for the first time in 15, 16 months. What's the first thing you're going to do when you get to that bandstand? I think I'm going to look around the stage at my friends that are on stage with me and feel giddy. I'm going to <laughs> smile. Because that's what I've been longing for. I mean, I, I love the audience, and that's 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 the world to us. But the bandstand to me is really one of the most exhilarating places I can ever imagine being. And so, just to get on stage and actually look next to me, and I'll see you know Russ Kunkel or you know whoever I'm working with next to me, and I see my friends on stage. I think that for me is going to be the most exciting thing. It's what I've longed for: is the community of band. Uh, and these are your friends. Have you been able to maintain some kind of conversational touch with them other than you know, remembering how they looked and how they played when you last saw them? How are you able to maintain that, that sense of their, their, their being present in your life? Because you haven't played with well, them in a year and a half. Well, uh, uh, we have a band called The Immediate Family, 
okay. now. And, and the band is basically uh, an offshoot of uh, the band we had back in the early 70s, The Section, it was called. And that was Danny Korchmar and Russ Kunkel and myself. Yeah. And then with the addition of Wadi Wachtel and another friend, Steve Postel, um, we've, we did an album just before the pandemic hit, which is finally coming out now. But during the course of the pandemic, we've kept on writing. We were doing distant things, but we did two live streams and we actually just went in the studio and cut another 10 songs for an, oh, wow. another album. So we've, sta we've stayed in touch throughout the thing. And when, especially once everybody got all their shots, um, we immediately started getting together and rehearsing and, and writing and playing. Um, but we haven't done a live gig yet. That'll, that'll be coming up in uh, the end of October uh, because everybody's booking. But we've, we've re we're really close friends. That's the, the beauty of having a band called The Immediate Family, is we really are an immediate family. Uh, so we, we've, we've maintained it. We did a cappella videos during the course of it and two live stream concerts. But, mm -hmm. um, but it's been very strange. I mean, you know, our daily routine was so disrupted in terms of our relationship with the other players in our lives. Yeah. But we did, we did manage to get together and do a few things. So mm -hmm. um, it hasn't been a, a completely Gobi Desert time for us. And, yeah, yeah. You know, do you lost. all live in the same general area of California? I'm close. Uh, everybody's in Southern California, but okay. uh, like Wadi, Wadi has probably about a two hour drive to get to rehearsal and stuff. Okay, so you weren't necessarily, yeah, so you weren't necessarily restricted from the uh, public transportation. Yeah. Said, many places has really stopped basically. Oh yeah. You know, uh, it's been horrific. Like Mm -hmm. It's been absolutely horrific for most players I know. Plus, in the middle of all this, um, remember the movie The Wrecking Crew um, yes. that Denny Tedesco did about his father and, and th th those fabulous musicians. Well, they're almost finished with a documentary movie about our group, the oh, same wow. kind of a thing called The Immediate Family. Okay. And uh, we were really plowing through the in, into this movie when the pandemic hit. And all of a sudden, we went from the... Uh, hair to the tortoise <laughs> and everything started you know, slowing slowed down dramatically but we finally throughout the pandemic finished all of the uh, filming and they're in editing mode now so things were being accomplished it, it was a very accomplishing year but in a kind of a surreal way you know you like you went into an alternate universe and you were doing many of the things you normally tried to do but in in such a different format mm -hmm. um, it's a, definitely a learning process what oh we yeah through. yeah yeah we, we learn new things every day and i think one of the things yeah. that gave me a chance to do was uh do more things that i know i should be doing but never stopped yeah. to take the time to do them uh, yeah and one of those things i've been spending my last 15 16 months is is working on base method books for my fledging publication company you know and i've come up with yeah. some unique ideas and some nice things to put in print so that people musicians bass players a public can see what's behind the notes i pick and, and what's behind yeah. my, I, my attitude as i uh, play the bass nightly when i can play the bass nightly <laughs> the next time i'm allowed to do that when you can't yeah you know yeah, but when you <laughs> can't it's a yeah, yeah, I thought it was intriguing when you were talking about that on a couple of the webinars uh, with Berkeley uh, yeah. about your books and, and things. Yeah, I think yeah. it, I think it's so important to um, to kind of pass on this information to uh, to new generations coming along. Uh, they won't be nobody will ever be you, but for you to give the information that you've gleaned over all of your years of experience. Mm -hmm. uh, can be so insightful for uh, for other people that are coming along that are studying you and stuff. So mm -hmm. I, I love that you're doing this. I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. We hope it becomes insightful and delightful. Yeah, that's it. any of those <laughs> folds. <laughs> Delight, delightful. <laughs> it, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I have, my, my neighbors know that I'm a musician, you know, and they kind of go to the jazz clubs and have a kind of a sense of our our musical community uh, yeah I, I was kind of stopped the other day and, and someone asked me 
hey, hey man, you've been on for a long time. What you been doing? And, and uh, uh, the other question was, what's it like not to work night in and night out? You know, for me, it's well, been it's... A, a, a very strange time and not making those decisions night in and night out. Would you, what, what's your solution to that kind of question when you ask? Because I'm sure you are. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's almost, uh, again, like in an, al in an alternate universe, because the routine that, that, you, that has been ingrained in your heart and soul for, for so many decades, suddenly you know, c coming to a complete stop, has been very strange. And I think the way I've dealt with it is I've actually found myself having the busiest year I've ever had even really? though I'm not working, uh, I've I've found so many projects to uh, to take on that, that, and I'm an and I'm an insomniac. I I hardly ever sleep, so I can be up in the wee hours of the morning still doing projects and stuff. But um, I had never recorded at home before this um, it happened, and uh, it, it was it was a very strange experience. A friend of mine contacted me, and he said that they were going to do a a cover of Phil Collins's uh, e Easy Lover. And they said, could you put bass on it? And I said, well, I'd love to, except I don't record at home. I've never been set up for recording. Um, I kind of used that as my social life. When I wasn't in the studio, if somebody wanted me to record, I'd call a friend of mine with a home studio and I'd say, how about if I come over and put bass on and then we can go get have dinner and I'll take you out to dinner. It was kind of that. And uh, so, uh, he this guy had a friend at SSL <clears throat> and they uh, next thing I owe in the mail, I got a SSL two plus interface and, and uh, plugged it in and contacted one of the members of our band, got a tutorial, a quick tutorial through GarageBand. And yeah. I mean, I was and I ended up doing about five albums uh, during this period for guys around the world. Last night I was doing a bass track for a guy in Germany. Um, so I, I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm playing, I, I have a YouTube channel that I'm devoted to every day. And I've, I've had a video, I've done at least one video a day um, for every day since March 23rd of last year. I have about 630 videos really? up now. Wow. And, um, and I did a, a coffee table book and I'm self-published and doing everything myself with that. Um, it's been it's been crazy, but it, it's all to me. It's all Plan B. It's like Plan A is being on stage and playing, um, and I've had to figure out everything else I can do that isn't that. And uh, but finally, finally, there's some, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel about gigs and stuff. So I'm looking forward to that. But it's it's surreal. I mean, I'm, I get real long winded, so I apologize for that. No, 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 no. no. Um, you've, you've done, but you've done a yeah, lot of you've... this. Yeah, it's it's just been very hard because I had a full year of, of touring and gigging uh, ahead of me before, when the pandemic hit, and and to see that all just evaporate uh, instantly, um, some postponed, but most canceled because they were. They were time related things and they really weren't going to be able to move them. It just had to be looked at as, as a, a lost opportunity. Um, yeah. And a lot of it was overseas, which would still be difficult at this point with because a bunch was Japan and Europe. And uh, and those are still in difficult situations. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I was looking at the paper this morning and they were saying the people that the, the, the uh, uh, Vaccine rate in Japan is like seven percent. Yeah, and I'm concerned. I have a tour that's set up for late this fall, and I'm concerned how they're going to run the Olympics with that kind of low vaccination rate. And, and uh, to I think that the, the jazz club is competing with that same small audience, I'm not sure how they're going to work that out. So, uh, like you, I have a lot of things that are uh, on in, in the in, in the hopper. Uh, yeah. that we don't know whether we should leave a suitcase in there or check out for mothballs and buy another one. You know, we're kind of concerned yeah. <laughs> with that mode, you know? <laughs> yeah. Japan's the same for me. I, I, I'm in a little shock. I mean, I, I'm sure the IOC pushed so hard for this because there's such a massive investment in doing the oh, Olympics. Oh, boy. And your, heart's always, and your heart's always with the athletes from the standpoint that 
so many of them, this is their peak moment in their lives in terms of being pre prepared. But the idea with the, this virus being as virulent as it is, and and still going on with this is it's hard to comprehend. Yeah, and it's amazing. We were supposed to be our band was supposed to be in Japan. Same thing for us. Everything's they're they're telling us now. Well, maybe spring of, of next year we'll be yeah. able to, to go back yeah. over. Yeah, um, and that's a cons that, that, yeah. that's a conservative estimate. You can't really tell given yeah the new strains that keep coming up in the daily. Yeah, time. this new one is yeah. really bad. Oh my yeah. goodness, you know. Yeah. Well, all we can do is kind of keep our base nearby and keep the case not too far from putting it on and get out of town when we can. <laughs> when we can. Yeah, feel like feel like paladin. Have base, will travel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> boy, you're going back to my era now. Yeah, <laughs> got the big mustache and a nice cowboy hat. Looked like any white with that hat oh, on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and really smart. You know, knew everything about art history, and I mean, he was a, the most unique cowboy character of that yeah. of that era. That's for sure. The only thing he used to upset me, he'd call this is this Chinese associate, "Hey boy," and I never yeah. liked that. I said, I said, it's, it's like Hop Singh in in Bonanza. Yeah, Paladin. You I know? mean, you know, you got bigger vocabulary than that, man. Those two words that are all the big words, you know, that contain twenty five letters. Yeah. And you and you settling on those six words? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure those six letters. Boy, are we're, we're still. We're still digging out of that historical hole. You know. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure your no, club likes yeah, those it, limited words that you pull out those well, other combinations. You know. Well, and and and, and demeaning the ethnicity of people. Yeah, man. Know, We've been doing that for a long time. We're trying to get over that hump. Oh, uh, uh, it's 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 so hard. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's so much. Uh, one of the questions I heard the other week, uh, and I asked one of my friends who who you, who you know. Uh, during this time when I'm on the bandstand and meeting new people in clubs and stuff, I, I've, I've lost that in, alternate environment. When you, go to, mm -hmm. when you go to work, you meet strangers, you meet fans, you meet your old friends. It's a whole other social environment. Well, for 15 months, I haven't had that. I've, met, I've been meeting strangers, you know? Yeah. And, and, and they want to know when you're going back to work, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, they asked me, well, <laughs> what do you want to talk? Do you know about, are you watching Mets, the local baseball team or whatever it is? Yeah. This is a chance for them to talk to me out of my environment and more mm -hmm. into theirs, the, the grocery store. Yeah. You know, or, or, or the shoe repair person, you know. And then when they, got, they have a chance to ask me questions that have nothing to do with a B-flat seven or Miles <laughs> Davis. You know, yeah. and uh, my question to you is, have you run across those kind of social activities, I'll call them, where you now have to deal with people on a completely different intellectual and emotional level than you would do if you were coming off the bandstand or walking around with your bass and they see where you're going to work, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I've always, I've always found myself kind of walking that, that path all the time. Uh, I, I, I get, like, I'll get recognized by people people but well so many times conversation immediately leaves music and we start talking about other things um and i really enjoy that aspect of things so um i don't get that many people i mean i get people that'll say in any word on when you guys are going to be playing live again i mean everybody wants that because because the the population is so chomping at the bit to go hear live music um and i always tell them i said when it's safe yeah, I'll be I'll be the first guy in line when it's safe. But I, I I've never played one note that's worth somebody putting their life in jeopardy over. And I want to see these you know the club owners and 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 the venues they want to open up as quick as they can because otherwise they're going to go under. Um, but when I meet people, uh, generally, I there's not a lot of questions about my history in the business, we just kind of, and I think I, there's times where I'm not embarrassed by it, but I'm not comfortable talking about it for the most part. I'd, I'd rather just talk about, you know, so what are you up to kind of thing and kind of redirect conversation and, mm -hmm. and find out about their lives and, and their interests. So mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't deal with it. And plus I'm in LA where you're being in the city 
you know, you walk out your door and you're in the middle of everything. <laughs> I'm out here. Where, you know, I, I go to the supermarket. No, you know, you know, the couple of the, the checkers know me, but for the most part, <laughs> so you know, you're you're in the hotbed of it. Yeah. So I could I could understand that. Uh, you know, especially especially if you were going down down the street. You know, and you you, you know you got your base, you got the wheel on it, and you're rolling it. To, you know, people would be real curious about it, and mm -hmm. anybody that knows music would recognize who you are, mm -hmm. and want to uh, glean a little info from you. Mm -hmm. But I I haven't really had that that situation and it's interesting for me too because with my youtube channel i created a clubhouse and two times a month i do about a two and a half hour live stream on it and there are tons of people on it we almost never talk about bass and music we'll, we'll talk about restaurants and food and uh, we, the one we had the other day everybody got into um talking about um movies and things, because uh, people tell me, they say, we'd love to join your thing, but we're not musicians. I go, it's not a, pre you know, it's, it's not predicated on musicianship. And then occasionally somebody will come on and we'll get into some technical things and talk about it. But it's, it's this sense of community and people all looking out for each other and being interested in each other, which really, I'm hoping will, when this really, there'll never be normal as we knew normal. Yeah, There's yeah. gonna be some new normal that, that'll that uh, develop out of this. But there are things that have come out of this period, I think that are things worth holding on to uh, in terms of our relations with other people and seeing what's really uh, important in our lives and other things that we were really bogged down in that suddenly not having them for 14 months, they don't quite seem as important as they did and other things have taken their place. Yeah, um, and yeah. that's so. It, it's kind of fun to be with a lot of people, and you, you know, they know my history. I know what I do, and I know what a lot of them do. But we we get our interests go in all other directions too. With you know, classic cars, and you know, you kind of mm -hmm. kind of name it. Mm -hmm. And all it takes is one person to say one thing, and the whole thing runs in that direction. So yeah, everyone gets. Uh, I don't know if I. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a. Uh, it's such a unique time in our history um, that we're going through. And, uh, and so, you know, but I'm really, if somebody wants to talk about those things, I'm, I'm very open with them and I love to talk about, about it, but it's not a conversation that I would ever um, launch, but uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, okay, well, it's the way I am when I do master classes or clinics. Okay. Uh, there's very little playing involved in them. Uh, to me, it's a, a Q and A is my favorite period. Mm -hmm. um, it really just, you know, letting people create the conversation and then, mm -hmm. you know, and and being a part of a, a, a dialogue. Because uh, mm -hmm. musically, I mean, I'll, I'll show examples of playing, but uh, that's a real small part of what I like to do. Mm -hmm. And it's the communication with other people uh, verbally that I also really enjoy beyond the, the musical vocabulary yeah. yeah one one of the things one of the first questions i ask when i'm asked to uh do a master class or that kind of musical event i ask them how do you find a master class and no one's ever had a real clear description of what a mm -hmm. master class should involve with them you know uh the ones i have done i've, I've always avoided critiquing a player as he plays mm -hmm. i think that's the most disastrous thing that can happen to any level of professional player, any level of player, whether it be a high yeah. school or a professional guy who's a teacher on this faculty, I thought that was a very cruel thing to do and a very unfair. Yeah, I agree with you. Use of the the critiquing that's necessary when you have a teacher and student relationship, you know. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we get we get to the question and answer about about music questions in general, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, but I, I kind of like being out in the street and having someone know who I am, but want to talk about football, yeah, you know, or a, a sport, you know, or a, an it's event great. that just happened in our neighborhood. It, it just lets me have a chance to express my thoughts, other than how can I make this guy understand that this F sharp is still a third of a, of a D seven chord, but he's not getting in the root on this chord. He's getting this all night. 
how can you <laughs> not to have to do not to have to do that yeah be able to talk about the local basketball scene you know and, and uh, that's a, a really relief for me and it allows me to think other thoughts that i can't yeah. think of when i'm going to work at night you know yeah i get people that drive by my house and I, i'm a voracious gardener and oh, i'm wow. out working in the yard and then i get people that stop and we we talk about gardening yeah and uh I, I I love that uh, I, I, because to me life is so multifaceted that to just focus down on this one aspect of you and 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 think that that defines you yeah um, is really a, a mistake because we all have so many different things in our lives that we find interesting. So when you can have a, a, a dialogue with somebody on levels other than that, I think I think it's pretty great. It brings it also kind of levels the playing field. Yeah, that you know you, you got this common ground that you both are coming to it gives us another level of conversation besides what i do you know yeah exactly uh, and i love what other people do you know i want to yeah. know what other people are up to yeah. you know if yeah. i meet somebody i had uh, i had a friend in high school that um i had I, I graduated high school i'm a little younger i graduated high school in 65 and when we graduated he went off to vietnam at that point and uh, many, many, many years later, he contacted me. A group of the guys from high school were going to have a little reunion. This was probably in the late '80s, I would think. We did this, and he. Uh, so we, we like eight of us, got together, and I and, they, and I walked into his house, and they had video on TV of me with James Taylor, and I'm going, "Oh Christ, here we go!" You know, <laughs> this, this whole thing. And I kept saying to him, "So what?" Do, what, what have you been doing? I mean, we haven't seen yeah. each other in all these years. And he goes, oh, no, it's nothing. What's what's Jackson Brown really like? I'll, and I yeah. finally cornered him. I said, tell me about you. And when he went to Vietnam, he was uh, a medic in, in Vietnam, came yeah. back, became a paramedic in Los Angeles. And in the area of LA where he lived, he was the top guy in, as a paramedic. If there was a disaster, he was the go-to guy. And I was so pissed off with him at that point going, all you want to talk about is music. I said, you're saving lives every day. You're doing all this amazing stuff, yet you're in your this own way kind of degrading that because you want to know about pop music. I said, I'm happy to have a dialogue, but God, you're doing unbelievable things and don't ever you know, say, I'm not doing anything. It's, uh, I said, you're doing astounding work and you're impacting people's lives. And sometimes you find yourself where people are starstruck because of like, if they talk to you and they go, Miles Davis, you know, I mean, things like this, it becomes reverence. And you go, I love being a musician and I love the community of musicians and music and relating to an audience, but there's so much beyond that in life. And for somebody just to kind of downplay that because they're starstruck, that can bug me. Okay. Well, you know, when I get that uh, uh, Miles Davis uh, question, paragraph questions, you know, yeah. I'd always tell them, well, Miles and I never discussed music. We would just talk boxing. We could talk about the, 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 the black politics in Harlem. We would talk about yeah. the stock market. You know, yeah. he, liked to, he liked to drive balls at the driving range. We never talked about so what. We never said one word about so near so far. We never talked about the amount of tags he played. That was all on yeah. the bandstand's conversation. When we when we yeah. left the bandstand with me, the topics were everything but music. And I, I that, great. Let's talk about something else. I have enough conversation on the bandstand with you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know three more let's paragraphs. Live, let's live a life together. Harmony. Huh? Yeah. No, they, you know, let's share our lives, not just our notes. Yeah, we've got other things to think about. You know, yeah. Right now it's hot. And those other, me... things, those other things make your music better. They affect your thought process. You know, having that relationship and, and, and a deeper sense of who we each are and stuff. When you start playing together, there's a different appreciation for each other too when, you, when you've shared things beyond the bandstand together. And, uh, and I, I'm the same way. It's rare when I've been off stage with people that we ever sit and talk about the music. I, I, you know, we maybe have a band meeting where we have to talk about it. But if we're out, we're talking movies and restaurants and, yeah. you know, what do you want to do today? Oh, there's a great, you know, there's a great museum in this town. Let, let's go there or botanical gardens or there's a great 
street of junk shops. Let's just go scrounging around and see what's to be found. Mm -hmm. And sharing like so many more aspects of your life than just, yeah. you know, the notes that you're playing on stage. Yeah. That's a given already. We got yeah. that. Let's go back one one line. You have a band meeting. I haven't heard that term. I haven't heard that term, Leland, since high school, high school, high school concert band. You know, they still go on, boy. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny I, I, when I was on the road with Toto. Um, I wasn't a member of Toto. It was a it was a double edged sword working with those guys because I had known them all since before they formed the group and. Uh, Steve Lukather, I had been playing with since he was 19 years old, wow. and and uh, you know, and Jeff Picaro was one of my closest friends, and we did hundreds of albums together. But when we were on the road, uh, so I ended up doing it because Mike Picaro was the drum, uh, was the bass player in the group, but he developed uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, mm. he had ALS, and he couldn't play anymore, and he was really in, in, in developing uh, full blown at that point and so they contacted me and said can you do the tour because mike just can't play and you know i was thrilled to be out with them because i love the guys but i hated why i was there because i would have given that give up gig up sure. in a second if mike could have come back <clears throat> but during the course of the tour they were having a band meeting and and i walked into the room and i was watching this go down and i looked at them afterwards i said this is why i'm not in a band <laughs> it's like all this all this bs that was going on and stuff i was just going man this is insane um, I'm, I'm i'm so fortunate that the, the the band that i'm in now after 50 years we've still never had a, 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 a bad word between us. We're all still really close friends and love each other's company and everything. But mm -hmm. you know, some of those band meetings would just, those are things that they should film and then show in school <laughs> courses, you know, just so people know what they're getting into. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this, this is the or else part of the band. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> those were the days when groups were groups though, man. You know, right now, but there, yeah. aren't, there aren't many groups that are, around for more than a tour or a set of concerts yeah. you know? and uh, yeah. uh, the despite my age category i miss being in those kinds of groups groups yeah. you know if you look at our at the history of the music you know dave brubeck's band with the same personnel for 10 15 years you yeah. know cannonball's band was another five ten years you know miles's yeah. bands were like five years per band or basically you know yeah. tom yeah. basie's band duke Ellington, and, and i miss I miss watching bands develop because the personnel is is the same night in and night out. Yeah. Well, there's and a I thing think, that happens. Yeah, there's a thing that happens where it gets it becomes this beautiful. Once everybody's settled into their place, then it becomes this well-oiled machine that that's everything is almost like second nature, and you're moving to that next level because the band is so solid at that point. Yeah, but you won't get that in two concerts or a tour. No, no. And, and I, I don't quite understand why the personnel, it seems to me, again, given my uh, being in, in my house basically for the past 16 months, and those those bands, groups, have not been able to work, it's like I haven't been able to go see them play yeah. and personnel changes, that they haven't settled into the concept of having a, a band that they can go to work every night with and see the same faces, make the same mistakes and fix them with the same guys. Yeah. You know, for five and a half years or more with that Miles man, we knew who was going to, we knew when we went to work, who's going to be there basically. You know, we knew There's the library. There's something magical about that. There's yeah, we knew, the, so we knew the library. And we knew that yeah. each of us was responsible for doing something in that band that we could count on happening every night. Yeah. Sometimes it wasn't always great. Sometimes it was not the best choice that we, we individually or group made. But we knew that we're in the same boat again tomorrow night. Yeah. We got to get this going. Yeah. And and I think that the yeah. groups today, like the groups with the quotation marks around groups, I think they're missing the opportunity to grow as as, as a an organism. You're and right. The more the personnel changes, the more the organism takes different shapes and, and different things happen. And I'm not sure that that's a great way to help that band uh, get past the, hello, my name is Marion, and what's your name? Stage, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 you're absolutely right. I, and, and there's a thing, yeah, there's that thing that happens w with the familiarity of people 
musically and, and, and personally, that when you walk on that bandstand and, and you look over at, at the next guy, it, it's somebody that you, you've, you've been having breakfast with on the road for, for years or something like that. And you just, you fall into a place that, you know, when it's new bands, you know, there's always this learning experience. Once you all know each other though, then you've, that stuff's all behind you. That's, that's a given. And then all of yeah. a sudden, all of the focus that happens is really the musical relationship on stage. Because I mean, for me with Russ Kunkel, um, I've been playing with Russ Kunkel now for going on 52 years. Wow. And when, when we walk on, when we're on stage together, we just glance at each other and we just smile because I, I know what I know. I don't know a specific fill he's going to do, but I know this is where he's going to do a fill and my ears are attuned to it so that I, I can anticipate things. And he does the same with me so that there's this beautiful dance between us rather than wondering what's this guy going to do right now kind of yeah, moment. Yeah. Even if he's a great player, there's always that, you know, you're, 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 you're listening on a different level as compared to with guys that you have this tremendous familiarity with and yeah. with artists too so oh, yeah there it. isn't that much of that most things are are pretty limited in in their scope in terms of you're going to do this and then you're moving on to the next gig and and certainly for me as a studio player which most of my career has been is every day i'm joining a new band yeah. i'm walking in and seeing new players and having a lot of the energy of the session that you would like to be devoting to the music is being devoted to kind of sussing out where's which where's this drummer's pocket you know where's how's he setting the beat and you know things like that yeah yeah but that's part of being a successful session player the ability to yeah. walk in there walk in there and know what each person needs you know i, I like yeah. to tell those guys my students who ask about uh, being a, a, a side person i guess that's the right rate that right, right yeah. phrase right yeah. now sorry lady side person what does yeah. it take to do that you know and I tell them, one of the things it takes is how sensitive you are to your environment. How can you, when you leave this studio, when you leave this one night, the band has to feel that you brought something great to the band. Mm -hmm. And they want you back. You have, you have to leave with that feeling. To make that work, there are certain elements that got to be in place to make that magic happen. Yeah. And among them is the ability to leave you somewhere else. And have that band now be the you, yeah. And the you has to make this thing work, you yeah. Know? And and successful side men, they have have a a, a a a special talent. I admire all those people who do that, including yours truly, who who, who do that stuff with the grace of of a, a pro. Mm -hmm. when this guy shows up. You know that the stuff is going to happen because what he brings, he or she. The yeah. expertise, the, the understanding of the music, their willingness to make it work, even if it may not be their personal choice of what works. Yeah. Their, their ability to make that happen despite their disagreement with the key that it's in for the instrument. You know, I've gone and played bass parts that if I played bass and wrote the part, I changed the key because it's easier for the instrument. But no one wants to know that when they call you. They want you to play what they wrote. Okay, exactly. you got that, you know? And yeah. those guys who can walk into that situation and make the part work because of what they bring to the date. I tell my students, that's all a part of working in New York. Mm -hmm. And it's you bring the same, the same thing same to the date in California. Exactly. Yeah, it's the same yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah, I always, gotta, I always feel that like every time I go to work, I'm, I'm joining a new band and I, I have to figure out how to assimilate into what I, I'm doing, it's it, you leave your ego, you you bring your confidence and your your abilities with you, but you don't impose yourself on the projects. You come in, and you figure how can I fit into this? Because um, I may I may only be here this one day with them, but I commit to it as though it's a band that I that I'm playing in, and yeah. um, and and I always, you know. I, I'm especially in this day and age where like when, when you're working on something and you you play a song and they do the first uh, first chorus and they go oh that's great we'll just cut and paste that into the second one and I go no no please please second chorus really has something has to happen this yes, song has yes. to evolve but yeah. I always tell them I said look when I walk out the door you do what you want I said it's your it's your project but I said I would like to leave 
satisfied that I've done the best job I possibly can. Absolutely. Now, if you want to cut and paste me after I've gone out the door, that's that's your prerogative. And uh, but it's it's a to me, studio is a fascinating world uh, of of emotions and, and 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 all kinds of different things that come into play beyond you. But your place in it is is a really interesting place. I've known a lot of guys that that have tried to place do studio work and they just can't do it because of the way they think about what they do and uh, their ability to be a chameleon and assimilate into, you know, completely radically different situations. Yeah. Um, and yeah. then, you know, guys I've known that have wanted to be studio players, but they can't read. Yeah. And I go, well, there's no way you can do studio work and not be able to read. And, yeah. and I was lucky that I started as a classical pianist. So if they screw up, and my charts are in treble clef. I can still read them or tenor clef and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, technically, it's 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 fine, but the commitment is the same every time. I would if if somebody who I'd never met called me for a session today, I would put the same energy into it that I would put into a Phil Collins or James Taylor project. To me, that's just a name on the project, but the yeah. commitment as a musician is the same every time. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I signed up. I, I signed up for the game, you know. Yep. And, yep. and I and I still have my uniform when the game is over. <laughs> yeah. I always tell people. I said, you know, when that phone rings, you got two options. You can say yes or no, and yes <laughs> comes with obligations. Yeah. You know, you, you're on. You if you're on time, you're late. Yeah. You know, you know, you you're there, ready to go. When that 10, 10 a.m. downbeat hits, you're tuned in your chair. You've looked if there's charts. You've looked through them to see if there's anything that's going to be a alarms go off or anything like that thank you you're not pulling in the, you're not pulling in the parking lot at that time yeah. i tell my guys if the dates is, if the dates at two o'clock if you get there if you get there at one o'clock you're almost three minutes late <laughs> yeah, exactly. people don't get that though they just <laughs> and i don't get that they don't get it i mean i'm going to work yeah i'm, I'm trying to be yeah. the best i can do i need to have a head start on what i'm facing and my head start is getting there earlier to make sure my base still work that hasn't haven't broken a string in the trans travel you know that they got a stool that I need. I mean, they had air, the air condition is not so, pointing toward the base booth anymore. I mean, just really simple details. Yeah, so many things. There's so much prep. It's like watching a pilot get on a plane. They're early, man. They're, they're flipping all these switches and going through their checklist. That's what we do. Yeah, we've got our checklist of things to be ready for the for the start of work. Yes, yeah. it's, it's the start of work isn't starting that. Yeah, no, so, it's an hour before. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I think that only people like you and I can have this kind of conversation because it involves being a guy who makes everything work based on what we are bringing in our preparation for this music, whatever the project is. You know, when I got yeah. the call to do a, 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 a James Taylor's sister's tune, I didn't know yeah. who she was, but I knew who he was because I listened to his music yeah. for a very long time. And I knew guys who played with him, and they just talked about how great a player he was and how yeah. sensitive he was, you know. Uh, so to, to meet her, I already had a head start on her sensitivity because her brother was such a wonderful player and a musician and, and a songwriter. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And He's a uh, remarkable so, artist, that's for sure. Yeah. I, I met him in passing, I'm sure, but I'd like to say hello to him one more time 40, 40 years later. So you can see that I've gotten a little a little more hair, a little more gray, but I'm still trying to run I'm still trying to find the best notes. <laughs> you know, that that'll that'll never change. You know, I always sit and I look and if I ever think about things like this, you you go back and you look at somebody like UB Blake, or you go back and you look at, at Horowitz in, in in Moscow when he was in his nineties and this theater is all weeping and this this old man is sitting at that piano in such command of your emotions. Yeah. Know? So hair color and all that, or lack thereof. <laughs> uh, not, I know I, I've, I've met a lot of guys in their twenties that are so old and, and not, not living life anymore. And I know so many guys at this point in my life in their late sixties through eighties that are still on fire and yeah. still have that burning, burning in their gut to go out and play. And, uh, every every night result. I go to work is a chance to get better. Yeah. One more course I can do better that makes last night's a warm up to this success for this moment. That's what we go to exactly. work for every night. 
You know, yeah. that's, that's nothing to do with the salary or being in the audience. It's about making yourself better and the band better night in and night out. Yeah, and it's absolutely. great to have the same band who understands what we're bringing to the gig. Yeah. That's, that's important to me. You know? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. you know? I think my last question, Mr. Sklar, if I can call yeah. you that rather than Leland. Um, well, call me Leland because Mr. Sklar was my father. Okay. Okay, <laughs> Leland. Um, yeah. When you get to the bandstand, finally, what other instrument would you rather be playing than bass? You know, I think had it isn't that far away from it, but I think had I had a choice of another instrument, still one of my absolute favorite voices in an orchestra is cello. Uh, I, I think I, I would have loved to have been a cellist. Mm. Um, it's just something, there's something about that, the, the, the register of a cello and, and, a, and a beautifully, you know, perform cello. I've had the, the good fortune of playing with Yo-Yo Ma and uh, there's a number of, of incredible cellists. Yes. But there's something about that that register that really gets to me from bass to cello, I think would have been it. I mean, I love all the instruments, but I think that would have been one that really would have an appeal to me as a second choice. Okay. Well, to tell the guys on this, tell Toto's band, be careful because it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hit the flea market and I'm going to find a cello and start sawing away. <laughs> well, well, don't buy any fleas because they've got plenty there too. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, one personal question. Uh, how yeah. big is your amp on stage? I, I work with as small a gear as I possibly can. Um, when I was out with Phil Collins and Toto and, and most of those kind of gigs, um, I go out with a, I, I, I work with a company called Euphonic Audio out of New Jersey, EA. Um, and their stuff's really beautiful, kind of hi-fi stuff. So I think on, on those tours, I had a single 4x10 on it and a 1x12. So those were the two cabinets I had. Um, on the 1x12, I used a, there's a, Yamaha makes a thing called a sub kick, which a lot of drummers, it looks like a little snare drum on a stand, mm -hmm. but it's sideways so that it's up and down. Yeah. And they put it in front of their kick drum. Okay. As, as, a, as a mic well we put one in front of my bass rig and it's unbelievable instead okay. of putting a mic <clears throat> so i put that in front of the one by 12 and then uh and just ahead i don't use pedals on stage or anything i'm just mm -hmm. straight into the amp and uh literally like in the biggest shows we would do with people like phil collins and toto we could talk like like this on stage uh, together. I mean, we're fortunate enough on those tours to have a great sound system. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. let the front of house guy do his job. Don't be so loud that your fader's off Yeah. Uh, in, in the house. Um, but that's as big a rig as I would go out with. But I also work with, like I'm getting ready to go out on this Peter Asher, Kate Taylor tour. And I'm going out with one of the EEA little doubler amps, which is like a two pound amplifier and a one by 12 on that. And that'll be my stage rig. Uh, How, how big that. is the stage for that small? Pick, I'm probably, small we'll, we'll probably be playing, you know, anywhere from three, 300 to okay. 800 seat places. Okay, really, really a personal kind of concert rather than the- Yeah, I, I love that. I, I mean, I went out with a real, when I went out, cause our, our common bond was, was Spectrum. Uh, with Billy Cobham. Sure. Yeah, I, I felt so blessed when when I, I thought, God, I got to share an album with Ron Carter. It was <laughs> like, so great. But Billy called me about 2003 and he said, well, it's been 30 years. Do you want to gig any of this stuff? <laughs> and, and so we went out and it was Gary Husband and Dean Brown and, yeah. and Billy and myself. And I still went out with a real small bass rig and we were playing, yeah. you know, large large clubs and and small theaters on that yeah. Yeah. but i always i always like to you know when i go and i hear a really loud band on stage and you lose all the definition or the front of house guy thinks the kick drum is the most important instrument oh on man stage. i want to i want i want to shoot those guys each twice i hate each, it each of them. I, yeah 
make just to make sure it's over yeah um but, but i i love like with phil i mean we would we'd be playing a hundred thousand seat places and daryl Sturmer and i the guitarist we could be on stage talking to each other during the show i mean out up front man it is a massive show but on stage we treat it like we're playing a club mm. and and I, I like the intimacy now it, it's tough like with our band the immediate family it's it's bass drums and three guitarists in it and the guitarists each they all sing um but when you're when you're fighting with sometimes the guitar player mentality of you know it becomes like a pose off at an end of a bodybuilding contest where you see these guys <laughs> <laughs> you know, pushing, you know, and I just we I, well yell and go stop this turn down. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's it we I, I try to keep it very under control. I want the audience to have the best musical experience they can have, yeah. and if you're too loud, they're not going to have a good experience. Absolutely, yeah. And and the bass drum is the first thing that stops all that from happening, man. It just wipes oh, out a whole range, whole range of stuff, you know. And, and uh, yeah, one reason I enjoyed playing with certain drummers, Tony, you know. Williams yeah, for yeah. comes to mind. He knew how to just right hand just just do like this for the bass drum. All you yeah. want to do is, is feel the impulse in your feet and let the bass do the rest. You know, it's just a great feeling. You know, oh, well, it's, you know, it's, I it's they made, huh? It's heaven. You know, when yeah. the drummer's like that. Yeah, you know, let man. it all be. Let it be the middle and the top of the kit be your statement, and let that let that bass drum just kind of like you said be there for the pulse of it but yeah man don't you know it's like my two least favorite instruments are bass drum and cajon because you end up working <laughs> with a guy with cajon and all of a sudden it's eating up our frequencies like yes. there's no tomorrow <laughs> yes you go, God, really really yeah. why what am i marcel marceau up here you know, <laughs> and I, I know him very well marcel <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been in his shoes many times <laughs> yeah tough one <laughs> well, uh, uh, Leland, I think it's time for your garden to need some tending by you, and I'm not taking your time, and I really enjoyed our conversation. I'm sorry we are so far apart, but when you come to New York next time, or I'm in your neighborhood, let's sit down and have a real cup of coffee and, and, and uh, just really have another in-person conversation. I've missed, I will miss having this with you until we can have it again. Absolutely. I would love to. And we'll talk about everything but music. <laughs> Please. <Yeah. laughs> what, are you, what are you growing in your garden, by the way? Um, well, it's not, it's not, it's more of like a, a, like an English garden. It's, it's like a lot of flowers and, and, and bushes. I, I tried to do a vegetable garden at one point and it was really nice, except then I would go on the road uh, and I would and come back and there would gone. be a zucchini the size of a Volkswagen bus. <laughs> you know? and, and so I finally just tilled the whole thing under and, uh, and it's just all flower beds and stuff. Okay. But, I just like getting dirt under my my nails, and uh, yeah. but you know, then I'm also suffering with like rose thorns in my hands. And <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to send you some nail 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 gloves. You know what those things are? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, but I always think of those things in hindsight. <laughs> you know, I see something and I go, "Well, let me go grab." Oh God! You know, I got bougainvillea and has a thorn about that long. On oh wow. It. And next thing you know, you just, you just, I've got one, I've got one that went right in at the edge oh, of my man. thumb oh. here. So it's every time I'm setting my thumb down, I'm feeling just a little bit, or I get a rose thorn in the, in the tip of that finger. You know, you go, why not in my kneecap? Why <laughs> right where I play? A reminder of how <laughs> dumb that was to do that. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot in hindsight. <laughs> well, look, you be careful and, and, and please, uh, uh, <laughs> Watch those bass drums. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And let's stay in touch, man. I, Ron, yes. I, just to glom on a bit. I've been such a fan for so long. And I so appreciate your legacy and everything you do and you're yet to do. Thank you. We've got, we got a lot of playing ahead of us. Yes, yes, sir. And I'm ready. As soon as they open the door to, to more than two customers, I'm right there. Boom. <laughs> yeah, like letting the bull like letting the bull out with the rider on his back, yes, you know. Yes. Boom, he's out in the middle of the corral. Yes. <laughs> with, with, with a maroon blanket, not a red one. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, my friend. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's all, all the best with you. Stay safe. <laughs>